Welcome once again into the Radiopedia Reading Room, a podcast that's quite frankly unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. All it cares about is radiology. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me for today's show brought to you by the letter P and the number two, it's my co-host Frank Gaylard. <laughs> are we going with a Sesame Street vibe? Are we branching off into <laughs> children's education? Radiology for toddlers. It's been pretty immature for a long time, this podcast. (laughs) May as well embrace it. No, today's episode is about two parts of the body that both start with the letter P. So that's why I went with the Sesame Street Uh theme. You want to try and guess what the two body parts are? Oh, I so hope. There's so many. Pituitary, putamen, pineal, uh, pulvinar, Purkinje cells. It must be some of those. Precuneus. Yes. You seem to have a, a fair neuroradiology bias there. Can you think of anything outside of the head? Uh, pancreas. Yes, that's one. And the other and, one? And uh, you probably think about it every night when you get up to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that old. Prostate. <laughs> prostate, indeed. Yes. So today's episode is about the pancreas and the prostate. So it's an abdominal radiology panel discussion. It was hosted by the smoothest voice in radiology, Dr. Vikas Shah, at Radiopedia 2022, and features fellow abdominal radiologists Ed Godfrey and Joe Mullineau. Uh, they are all in the UK. Joe and Vikas are at the University Hospital Leicester, and Ed is at Cambridge University Hospital. So that's what we're about to listen to, Frank. Well, that sounds like the kind of episode that might finally get my wife, Natalie, to listen to it. Oh, yes. As, as you know, she's an abdo radiologist who is actually... She's the biggest Hermione Granger nerd that you've ever met. She very recently was at ESCAR, I think it's an abdo conference, I don't know, in Spain, Valencia. So she had a day off before the conference started. And what does she do? She she goes to the Science Museum <laughs> and she sends me a text at like 3 o'clock in the morning with a photo of this old dude, Ramon E. Cajal, yeah. and the following text. There's a whole section at the Science Museum to my favourite gastrointestinal cells, the interstitial <laughs> cells of Kajal. The tumour is the gist. So cool! Exclamation mark. Oh my god! Unbelievable. That is a mighty Gran- Granger-esque. Uh, um, that, that actually reminds me, Craig Hacking, who's doing uh, some long service leave over in in Europe at the moment. He sent me a photo the other day from Amsterdam, I think, a science museum in Amsterdam where they had a Radiopedia image yes, on the wall as that. one of their, yeah. yeah, they had like a barium enema, an apple core lesion. Yep. And it said possible tumour or something like that. It was the most obvious tumour you've ever seen, <laughs> but they kind of toned it down. Now, Craig and I went to the Space Museum in, I think it was Los Angeles together, because he's a big space nerd he's as well. He's a massive space so, nerd. So yeah. uh, it was so cool. He's been collecting how many of the space shuttles he's seen. I've only ever seen the one. Uh, it was pretty amazing, I have to say. It was so much bigger and heavier and clunkier and homemade looking yeah. than I thought. It was uh, when I saw one, it kind of looked like you know you could see the like the running repairs that had been done. Yeah, it's like a school bus with wings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we better get into this week's panel discussion. So it was recorded live directly after Ed had presented his lecture entitled "Cystic Pancreatic Lesions" and Joe a lecture entitled "An Approach to Prostate MRI." both of which can be found over on our website in the Abdominal Imaging Lecture Collection. Oh, by the way, there is actually a, a potty and poo-themed Sesame Street episode that is brought to you by the letter P and by the number two. Oh, really? <laughs> which is quite funny. <laughs> I'll see, we'll see if Murph can dig it up and maybe play a little audio clip from it as we head to this panel discussion. <laughs> so let's, let's listen in now to Vickers, Ed and Joe. And the topics are pancreatic lesions and prostate MRI. And then Frank and I will be back at the end for another chat. Oh, Elmo had fun talking to you about the party today. Elmo hopes it helped. Sesame Street was brought to you today by the letter P. <laughs> oh, and by the number two. <laughs> I'm now joined by the speakers of those two talks, Joe Molyneux and Ed Godfrey. Thank you both for joining me for this live chat. Some people watching might have got hungry watching those talks because you put together quite a strange menu. So I've got listed here fried eggs, gulab jamun, which is my favourite, cheese, grapes, and then some Cambridge cappuccino to finish with. 
I'm not sure how many people you're going to get in your in your restaurant, uh, gentlemen. So, Joe, you've described fantastically all the different signs to look for when we're looking at prostate MRI to differentiate benign lesions from malignant lesions. But I wanted to talk to you about the actual protocol and the way the test is done. So the first of all, I assume that most of these are done using surface array coils because they're just easier for the radiographers, but is there any role for an endorectal coil? And also what about the magnet strength? Does it matter whether it's 1.5T or, or 3T? Is there any evidence that pushes us into one or the other direction? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the endorectal coil, really. Um, I've got some experience with endorectal coils, um, mainly as a fellow inserting them. I can say it's not pleasant for the patient or for myself, um, yeah. really, to insert them. So thankfully, we don't use them that often, particularly for this group of biopsy-naive patients. You can get some susceptibility artifact if it's not done perfectly on the diffusion imaging. It does get a really nice T2 image. So if you are going to use an endorectal call, its primary function will be in staging, which I didn't really cover in the talk. But as I'm aware, we don't really use it at all in our institution anymore. Some people may still use it. So it has some benefits, but generally not a standard use is the endorectal call anymore. Moving on to the, the strength of the magnet, Pyrads does have some guidance on this. And generally they say that 3T is best as it's gonna give you the best signal to noise ratio. So if you have a 3T scanner, you should try and put your prostates through on that. However, they don't say 1.5T cannot be used. So if okay. you have a center that only has a 1.5T, if you use the correct, if you get the parameters set up nicely, you can get good images um, of the prostate. So generally you should try and use a 3T, but if you haven't, don't worry too much. And the 1.5 is actually really useful when you've got patients who have prosthesis and things that can cause artifact. So we generally put all our patients with hip prosthesis in a 1.5T scanner because you get less artifact and you actually get a better image overall. So that's, that's basically what we do in our center. And what about how you prepare the patient? So I know when we do rectal MRIs, there's a lot of talk about giving patient enemas to ensure there's no fecal matter within the rectum and also using buscopan uh, to reduce bowel motion. So I, I assume that those have been considered for prostate MRI, but is there any advice you have about those two issues? Yes. Yeah, so I think anyone who reports a lot of prostate MRI, rectal gas and rectal fecal material is the bane of your life because basically it's with one of the most important sequences, but is often degraded by artifact. So it's very hard to deal with. Lots of people have discussed whether the patient should have an enema before a procedure um, for a, a, a prostate MRI and whether that's going to actually get rid of the problems. However, I, I think that can actually initiate some bowel movement as well. We haven't tried it in our centre, but I've read that people have seen you actually get more bowel motion once you have a enema, enema. So I think the best thing to do and what we do is ask the patient to empty their bowels before a, an MRI and then if it is non-diagnostic, you can always recall the patient with specific instructions to try and empty the bowel and try again, basically. And what about buscopan? Do you routinely use that in your protocol? Generally, we don't use buscopan. It has been suggested that it can be used to reduce the bowel motion and get better, particularly T2 images of your prostate. However, the issues are with prostate, you've got a group of patients who may have an enlarged prostate, so could be prone to urinary retention. So we don't want that side effect. So gen we don't generally use it, but I know it has been used in the past. Just moving on to your talk, Ed, describing your approach to cystic pancreatic lesions. And what strikes me as someone who reports a lot of general CT, general abdominal CT, is that we come across a lot of these small incidental cysts. And a lot of people don't know what to do about them. So I know that um, in my center, I work with Joe. Joe runs the pancreatic MDT and they're inundated with these small lesions that people don't know what to do then. And they, they know that the title of the disease has neoplasm in it and neoplasm means cancer. So let's just send it to the cancer MDT. But of course, many of them are benign or have very low malignant potential. So how do you deal with this wave of patients who are coming to the meetings that don't really need to be there, but because people don't know what to do with them when they're reporting the scans? 
Yeah, thanks. That's a great question and, and a problem we struggle with as well. I think it's well known that a lot of a lot of people, so in their 60s and 70s, probably 10 to 20% of people have a pancreatic cystic lesion if you look hard enough. So there are plenty of people with these lesions and your MDT will be very full if you try and look at all of them. I think that there is certainly a benefit of subspecialty radiology review of them though. So whether it needs to have a sort of slightly parallel process to a standard MDT, that can work quite well. So what we what we have tried to implement and with variable success is to um, have those patients referred up to the MDT, but then they're not discussed. The radiologist maybe documents a, an impression of the cystic lesion and then um, their, the follow-up and everything else is a standardized template and they're, they're not formally discussed in the MDT. And that can save you time to discuss the, you know, the, the more complicated patients that, that do need genuine multidisciplinary discussion. But I think some of the cystic lesions that, that we went through in the talk can look very similar to even a small solid lesion, pancreatic, pancreatic cancers, when they're small, can be quite dis- difficult to distinguish between um, a solid and a small cystic lesion on CT. So I, I, I'd be keen that anything in the pancreas gets seen by a, by a radiologist who's, who's used to looking at these lesions. So effectively um, providing a kind of focused double reporting service for a selected group of these patients that then avoids yeah. putting them through the whole MDT where you're using up lots of different people's times. So while that does take up the time of one radiologist or one or two radiologists, overall, it's probably more efficient from a sort of systematic or systemic perspective, organizational perspective, right? Absolutely. And then I think our role is to educate non-HPV radiologists about the the importance of the patient being fit for surgery. So as soon as as soon as you've got a patient who is is likely to be unfit for pancreatic surgery, then you can forget about any sort of cystic lesion. Uh, obviously, if they've got a solid lesion. We still need to see those patients, but uh, yeah, I think that's that's the important take-home message for non non subspecialty radiologists: is try and look at the patient fitness and comorbidities, and think about whether they're likely to be a candidate for surgery. Yeah, that's a really important point. I think that kind of bridges across lots of different subspecialties where there are things that we find on reports, and I think sometimes we don't know how fit or unfit the patient is and so we really are relying on the clinicians to make that judgment call but then we also have to make sure we teach them what are the therapeutic measures that could be instituted for this particular disease and what impact would that have on that patient's life because i think sometimes some clinicians maybe don't become not familiar with what is the reach then you know of new therapeutic procedures and how they could be done as day case procedures or you know with minimal anesthesia and they may think well you know, I don't know what's suitable for this patient, so I'll just send you send it on to the MDT. So there's a, there's a bit of crosstalk there, but it's not efficient, right? So I think, yeah, you're right. It's a neat, it's a two way communication process, isn't it, to clarify what is achievable safely, but also telling them which patient groups should really be referred. Definitely, and if you think there may be borderline for fitness, then then reporting it and saying this would, you know, if if the patient would be a candidate for surgery, then please refer to the MBT. I think is a useful approach. But you're right. I think we're always going to discuss some patients that turn out not to be not to be fit, but that's that's probably appropriate. Too. Yeah, Joe, you you alluded um, just a little while ago to things that can cause problems with the diffusion weighted imaging, which is a really important sequence. So you know, yeah. we talk about rectal gas. And it's one of those sequences that when it works, it's fantastic. It's so helpful, just like you've illustrated. Have you got any other tips on how to optimize the diffusion sequence? And what do you do if it's not good enough to make a diagnosis? So do you always just do you always do a contrast series and fall back on that? Or do you recall patients? Yeah, I think that it's a really interesting question and, and, and a debate in, in people who do a lot of prostate MRIs is what to do with these patients who you literally aren't going to get a very good diffusion weighted imaging. You may have called them back twice and you've still got a rectum full of gas and you're just not going to get, or they've got a hip replacement, you're not going to see um, part of the gland with diffusion imaging. So that's where dynamic contrast imaging really comes into its own. And in PyRADS, you can actually substitute the diffusion imaging for the contrast. Now it's not as good but it's something, and you've got to communicate that to, to your referrer, that there are limitations for using this, but that's what Pyrad suggests. So that's why we use contrast still for every patient. Now, there is a debate whether 
contrast is required for every screening patient. So whether you can move away from a multi-parametric assessment to a bi-parametric assessment, so basically just a T2 diffusion weighted imaging and then your T1 imaging for, for the rest of the pelvis. I think there's no clear consensus. Um, I think PIRAD still recommends obtaining the diffusion and, and the um, contrast together. And that's what we do at our, our institution because it, it can be very helpful in, in those situations where you've not got the perfect scan. Right, okay. So there you're sort of alluding to possibility of an abbreviated MRI mm. protocol for the purposes of screening. Yeah, very so large... screening or, yeah, screening this population who are biopsy naive but present with symptoms and a raised PSA, yeah. Yeah, and it's in vogue, isn't it? The, the creation of abbreviated MRI protocols for all sorts of different diseases. Yeah. And Ed, you alluded to the one for surveillance um, that's been described. That's, I think you said it's, um, is it eight, 10 minutes for the entire three sequence set, isn't it? And it's very effective in able to monitor those patients. Yeah, absolutely. So for the, the vast majority of people who haven't had any changes, you can leave it at that. And then the odd, the odd patient where things have moved on, you can bring them back and do a, we'd usually do an EUS at that stage, but you could do a more comprehensive MR. Now, talking about EUS, um, it really was a major feature of, of your talk. So I think most radiologists will be familiar and comfortable with CT and MRI, um, but not necessarily EUS. And you talked about uh, EUS and another layer of top, which is biopsies or FNAs, and then on top of that, contrast ultrasound. So these are all very specialized areas of, of working that you have certainly developed in your career. And I just wanted to ask you about that. You know, Do you think every center that deals with pancreatic lesions should have people with these skills? Or is it is it kind of just in like an added bonus? And how was your training experience? Did you come from a gastroenterology background? So did you have some endoscopy skills already? Or did you learn them all? as part of your radiology training? Oh, great question. So well, I'll deal with the training question first. So I, I alluded to my, my friend and mentor, Nick Carroll, and he was real big, a big figure in my training. So I hadn't, I hadn't done any endoscopy prior to going into radiology, but um, Nick, who is a radiologist and world-renowned expert in endoscopic ultrasound, was, was working in my department. And I just saw what he was doing and thought that looks fantastic. So I think we all meet these inspirational figures in our careers and, and want to emulate what they're doing. Uh, so through Nick, I was able to to do endoscopic ultrasound training. It is quite, um, it is a, a big time commitment to learn. So it's probably a, about a day a week for at least two years, more like three years for most people. And even then that's sort of getting you at the basic level of the US and then you, then you continue to teach yourself on the job. I think it, it is something that radiologists can do well. It doesn't matter really which specialty you come from. So in the UK, it's done by gastroenterologists, surgeons, and radiologists, and probably um, about a third of the EUS in the UK, I would guess, is done by radiologists. Um, I work in a centre where it's a mixture of gas, gastroenterologists and radiologists doing the procedure, and I think that that's really nice because both specialties bring different skills, and it is very interdisciplinary. And I think it is it is such a useful tool in the pancreas because you see so much more than you can see with with CT and MR. I think the cases I showed hopefully illustrated that that you know in, in the case of a possibly enhancing five millimeter nodule on CT, you can see it and it occupies the whole screen with the US, um, and you and you have these various different adjuncts to 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 put into it. So I think with cystic lesions, it's interesting. We've we've been through very um, high tech additions to the standard technique so um, intracystic biopsy where you put a biopsy forceps down a needle inside the cyst and take chunks away and then even um, what's called a confocal endomicroscopy where you put a tiny microscope probe through the needle and into the cyst and you know you can imagine these things are very expensive but what's turned out to be probably the, the, the most important change in recent years is just measuring the, the amount of glucose in the fluid and that gives you a very strong predictor of whether the, the cyst is a mucinous or a non-mucinous lesion. And that's really the most important question we're trying to address, certainly with current technology. Uh, I think sequencing might play a role further down the line in trying to pick up patients who've got advanced neoplasia, so that sort of high, high-grade dysplasia or invasive malignancy related to a cystic lesion, but we're not quite there yet. And, and speaking of endoluminal ultrasound, Joe, is there any role any longer for endorectal ultrasound, so I'm thinking maybe areas, uh, maybe in those instances where MRI is contraindicated or for a particular patient? 
the predominant use of uh, ultrasound in the pro transrectal ultrasound would be for, for biopsy of the prostate. So you don't really get as much information as you would from an MRI. So you'll just see an area that looks different, usually in the um, peripheral zone. Sometimes you can see things in the transition zone and you can biopsy. Actually, one of the best uses is, is the fusion. So using the MRI imaging with the live ultrasound imaging, you can do fusion biopsies and actually target areas that, that were abnormal on the MRI imaging. And that's, that's the main use, I think, for the, the ultrasound and actually transperineal ultrasound guided fusion is, is seems to be the, the the latest thing that that is the best thing for the patient reducing risk of complications and infections yeah. um, from the transrectal route yeah you talked about pyrads in your in your talk and pyrads four and five are differentiated um, by the size of the the lesion that you measured 1.5 centimeters do you have any tips on how that measurement should be made? So any particular sequences it needs to be made on and is it the shortest axis or the or the longest axis? How should we measure that? Yeah, so that's really important because that will 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 change a whole whole category in the pyrads. So they are quite specific in the guidance. So in the guidance they they recommend that you you find the largest dimension on your dominant sequence for that zone. So say your, your lesions in the peripheral zone, you will use diffusion imaging and specifically the ADC map, um, and you measure the largest dimension. Now, all our diffusion imaging is, is acquired only in the axial plane, so you would take the largest axial measurement on ADC. If you have a lesion um, in the transition zone and it's actually largest on the coronal or the sagittal acquisition, you take the largest dimension. So it's quite clear in the guidance. And if you're not totally clear, I always check back and go, have I measured this correctly? Because especially if it's going to make a difference to your pyrides grading. Yes. Yeah. Talking about size and, and measuring the lesions, that, that was one of the factors that would determine when lesions are surveyed, right, with the, with the pancreas um, based on the specific size. But it seems to me that there's a lot of variability in the guidelines that are out there and also variability in their application it seems very confusing. So is there anything out there on the horizon that can help people, any more consolidated or consensus guidelines to help us figure out what do we do with each specific situation? I think it's really difficult. I think one of the, one of the most important things that I think you can look at for each patient is just their age, because we know that there is a cumulative risk of having one of these things. And so if, you, if you've got to live with it for a long period of time, then that to me is, is a, a very important thing to consider when you're thinking about surveillance and treatment. And um, I referenced that Cherniak, uh, that paper by Victoria Cherniak, um, which is fantastic. And um, uh, what it showed was that if you have a cystic lesion, it has a much more pronounced effect on your all cause and your pancreatic specific mortality if you happen to be under 65. And so Although I think it's it's probably not right to think of these as just part of the normal aging process, they are far more significant in young patients for that reason. Yeah. So I think we should we should probably focus more on the age of the patient when we find these lesions. Yeah. Um, but size size is important. It's um, w when you look at the studies assessing the the size of this cystic component in branched duct IPMNs, there's quite a lot of conflicting evidence as to whether that's a, an important feature or not. So. I think the jury's out, but we, we, we may have to move to other ways of risk stratifying these patients. Uh, and I think that um, probably some of that will involve sequencing either uh, from blood samples, looking at circulating DNA or um, maybe even duodenal aspirates. Uh, and the, the attraction of both of those techniques is that, you know, we've, we've talked about how cystic lesions are reflective of a field effect in the pancreas and that often the tumors arise distant from that cystic lesion. So some sort of way of sampling the whole pancreas and what's going on, and not just at the point of where the cyst is, is, is going to be quite useful. Okay, so yeah, some exciting developments coming up ahead too, because obviously, as you said, because of the field defect and because of those long-term rates of potential malignancy, there is a requirement for quite a, a long period of surveillance for these patients, isn't there? 
just one thing to clarify with solid pseudopapillary neoplasms, we've seen lots of different variations on whether they're labeled SPN or SPEN. Is there any major difference between them? Does it really matter? I, I think you pays your money, it takes your choice, either's fine. Um, as long as yeah. you're clear on, on what you mean and what and, and the surgeons are also interpreting it in the same way that you work yeah. through. And that's yeah, that's fine. Do you have any sort of final tip, one or two tips for everyone watching about what they should do when they come across one of these lesions? Yeah, I think well I, there are probably two things that you could read. So if you're just starting out, then I think the the international consensus criteria give you a really good framework for how to think about mucinous lesions in the pancreas. And the majority are mucinous lesions, the ones that we come across day to day. So recommend that. And then if you're already involved in um, managing these patients, then that paper I mentioned by Victoria Cherniak is is fantastic and really yeah. brought on my understanding of of the significance of what we're looking at. Uh, so those would be my two top tips. Thank you. And Joe, likewise, have you got any tips for everyone watching about how to deal with prostate MRI? Yeah, I think the hardest zone really to 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 look at is the transition zone. So my top tip is on your T2, really assess it on the coronal and the axial planes, looking for those areas that you can draw around because a lot of things look very abnormal and worrying on one plane you flip them onto the other plane and they look completely benign so that's my top tip there and another one is read that pyrads document in detail because it's fairly short but it's full of excellent advice that's that's really succinct and it helps you standardize your reports and i'm, I'm a big fan of pyrads great thank you very much both of you for joining me uh, next we have an Thank you once again to Vikas Shah and to Ed and Joe for that panel discussion. I, I forgot to mention in the intro, Frank, that you can catch all three of these guys again at Radiopedia 2023, which is less than a month away now, July 24 to 28. So Vickers and Joe have recorded new lectures, one on pitfalls in abdominal CT and the other on mm. splenic lesions, respectively. And Ed's cystic pancreatic lesions is also being played as one of our encore lectures at the conference. And Vickers and Joe are also doing one of those 90-minute interactive workshops oh, uh, on renal imaging. And for those who haven't seen it, our online workshop format is really something to behold. I think, Frank, you're doing one workshop on neurovascular imaging. I'm doing one on trauma yep. radiology. So there are four workshops, and they're all free for the delegates. So as long as you're registered for the conference, you can attend all of the uh, workshops during the event. Right, Frank, anything from that panel discussion that you wanted to chat about? Well, I got a little bit sidetracked, I, uh, I must admit. Doesn't sound I, like you. <laughs> I was on uh, Mid Journey, which is one of those text-to-image oh, yeah. uh, services. Oh, yeah, what have you done? And uh, because it's Sesame Street, I thought we'd have a go at having a Muppet radiologist have a look. Oh, oh that is good. That is good. <laughs> Very nice. We probably should try and um, use that as custom artwork for the episode or something so that yeah. so that the listeners can have a look. So just because I was doing a mid-journey doesn't mean I wasn't listening, though, Dixon. And there was lots <laughs> in there that I was actually really interested in. One of the ideas there was of including whether or not a patient is fit for treatment in your report mm -hmm. to guide whether referrals are needed. One of the expressions that uh, we use, I think, in Australia is whether a patient is fit for a haircut, yeah. meaning if they're so frail that they're not going to stand a haircut, they're unlikely to be able to have a Whipples or whatever yeah. it's needed. The other one uh, that we use in the neuro-oncology meeting at Royal Melbourne to decide whether a patient is fit enough to undergo a standard Stuck protocol or whether they need an abbreviated course uh, for more frail patients is the Royal Melbourne tram test. <laughs> What's that one? If you're well enough that you can get yourself to your outpatient appointment using the tram, <laughs> then you're well enough to cope with standard radiotherapy and all the visits that that entails. Whereas if you need to be, you know, brought in and you're in a wheelchair and all of that, then you're probably not going to be able to tolerate it. Often you don't have that kind of clinical context to know whether what you're seeing is important to the patient. And I often in those situations, like if I see a patient and they're, you know, 94 years old and I'm spotting some lesion, I'll often still describe it and talk about what 
you know, the next step might be in my conclusion, but then I'll follow that up with if clinically appropriate. And so basically I'm saying to the referrer, look, feel free to ignore my recommendation entirely because I suspect this patient doesn't really need a pancreatic MRI. That's kind of words that I use. What, do you do anything similar? Yeah, I think where clinically appropriate or if clinically appropriate is something I do use. I also have to say that sometimes I just ignore findings that mm -hmm. are not going to be relevant in that situation. So, for example, if you're in your 90s and you have a one millimeter, maybe infundibulum, maybe aneurysm of the ACOM or something, then there's no joy for anyone to put that person through the follow-up and additional. No one's going to coil it. No one's going to treat it. You're not even going to follow it up. Some people would say that that's sort of uh, paternalistic. And remember when Jenny was talking about thyroid nodules and not mentioning them all, and that endocrinologists were saying that it's not the radiologist's role to do that, that they mm -hmm. should just come out. I, I disagree and agree with Jenny. I think it is our role. We know what the natural history is of these findings. And often you're doing more harm than good by mentioning every pineal cyst every tiny ditzel, et cetera, particularly in the elderly or people that have bigger problems on mm. their plate. Well, I 100% agree and I ignore a whole lot of things. The only concern sometimes I have is, you know, you can have a very, very good 90-year-old and then yeah. you could have a very, very unwell 70-year-old and so sometimes you don't know and so that's yeah. where I do kind of use that if clinically appropriate because if this is an 80-year-old who's really doing really, really well, then maybe you would investigate Similar to the, this concept, another thing that came up in this panel discussion was that idea of subspecialized radiologist review rather than MDT. I see a lot of people recommending in their report conclusion, you know, recommend MDT review, when really all it kind of needs is someone who has a bit more experience than you as a radiologist, maybe in their area, to look at the images and, and make that call. We do that informally at our hospital because often if I'm looking at a, a CT abdo and I see a pancreatic lesion, I'll often call up one of the body radiologists and get them to have a look at the time. You know, how should I word my report? Do you do something similar? Uh, I mean, we do lots of internal second opinions, but mm -hmm. uh, that's because we're in a subspecialized larger department. There's lots of radiologists that don't have that. Yeah. I mean, we bitched and moaned about MDMs recently and we could bitch and moan about MDMs pretty much every <laughs> single episode. We're not going to do that. But MDMs are an enormous sink of resources. When you think how many people there are in that room and you add all those hours together, they're hundreds and thousands of dollars per MDM per week. Hmm. And to waste everyone's time just to get one person's opinion um, so yeah, subspecialty review or just a second opinion. Mm. Ideally, you can do that yourself. But if you're a solo radiologist out in the community, asking that is is great, and also avoids re-scanning patients to get that second opinion. Yeah, and I say this to my trainees all the time, and I said it just yesterday, in fact, that when someone comes to you asking to go over a study that your department has done the last thing you should do is say something dismissive like, well, have you read the report? Because what they're asking for is a second opinion. And how many times with a little bit more clinical guidance do you find the abnormality that was mm -hmm. missed when it wasn't? Yeah. I think that's super important. That's where you value add and where you add above and beyond just lesion detection, mm -hmm. but you put it into context and you have a discussion with the clinicians. You often offer advice and context for them more two-way discussion a bit more casual as well yeah. can often can often get to the to the right diagnosis uh anything else to talk about from this panel discussion gala well, shall we talk about pi rads and oh gosh all, no all the other rads <laughs> fortunately neuro doesn't have too many rads or if there are i don't use any of them but when we say rads we're talking about those radiology and oh my God. reporting data systems that are cropping up everywhere I feel very ambivalent about them because on one side, clearly having defined ways of discussing things and categorizing them is important. But the flip side is I just feel like a data entry clerk when mm. I use those sort of things. I used one, it wasn't a RADS thing. It was a Lowe's score for patients with X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. Some clinician <laughs> asked me to do it and I looked it up and it's a score out of 34 with uh, lots of different structures that you have to evaluate and give a tick, et cetera. And at the end of it, it's like, what am I doing with my life? Honestly, I should be somewhere 
I should be in Valencia getting drunk on sangria and going to the science <laughs> museum. <laughs> Reminds me of our April Fools this year that I put together, the Rad Rads. Oh, the Rad Rads. Yeah, that went that went very well. I can't believe we didn't actually talk about it on the podcast. I meant to back in April, but we must have got distracted by something else. If anyone hasn't checked out Rad Rads, I think I'll put a link in the show notes to Rad Rads. This was kind of our satirical take on these radiology reporting and data systems. We created a, an easy to use and practical reporting and data system for classifying radiology reporting and data systems. <laughs> and we went from, you know, RADRADS 1, which was benign radiology reporting data system, through to RADRADS 5, which was a malignant reporting and data system. Uh, I've got it up here. I might just read out uh, RADRADS 1 and the criteria for that. So RADRADS 1 uses simple image features and whole number cutoffs, straightforward single step categorization provides flexible and useful management recommendations and easy to remember annual follow-up intervals. So that's a good level one. Do any Rad of Rads. those exist? <laughs> and then uh, for I'll skip to RADRADS 4. So this is suspicious radiology reporting and data system. Uses dubious imaging features, non-intuitive oblique measurements in non-standard planes, ratios, percentages, and or enhancement curves. <laughs> Sounds like your 32 <laughs> steps that you were doing. Highly complex multi-step categorization process resembling a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> You'll be needing a color-coded chart or three. Excellent. <laughs> Provides costly and invasive management recommendations that keep everyone busy. And then finally, follow-up intervals that ignore the linearity of time and require knowledge of patient risk factors not found in the <laughs> EMR. That's most of them, isn't it? <laughs> I can't wait to see an article that doesn't recognize that this was an April Fool's and in the description of their RADS system, yeah. you know, says uh, we our aim was to develop a Rad RADS 1 <laughs> RADS. <laughs> it would be good. Actually, if you Google Rad RADS, it does come up. <laughs> so, so people should do that. Anything else to chat about? So the other thing that uh, came up was the idea of abbreviated studies. Yeah. And I think that's really important and something we don't do anywhere near enough. And one of the reasons I don't think we do enough of it is that we frame the question incorrectly when asking ourselves if we want to have an abbreviated study. And the way that we frame it is, do you want the full study or do you want this one that's missing sequences? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, obviously I want the full study. Who wants the lousy missing cut rate study? That's not the real question. The real question is, do you want the full study or do you want the abbreviated study so that you can scan more patients and report faster? Mm -hmm. And when you frame it that way, I mean, in our hospital system, at least, we have uh, constraints on waiting lists and how many patients and our backlog of reporting is through the roof. It'd be much better to have shorter mm -hmm. ones. It would end up with better patient outcomes. And actually, it's happier. I'm always happier reporting those short abbreviated yeah, yeah. studies. That yes, no thing actually reminds me of a little story. I used to go to this little bakery at lunchtime and get a vanilla slice. And they had, you know, your standard vanilla slice, what we call in Australia a snot block. And then they had, <laughs> they had like the fancy French vanilla slice. Yeah. So I said, I said, uh, can I get uh, a vanilla slice? And the staff member goes, do you want the good one or the bad one? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's the ultimate upsell, isn't it? I'm like, uh, I'll have the good, the one, good thanks. one, thanks. Yeah. What sort of idiot would she you be me. to say, I'll yeah. have the bad one, thanks? I actually don't mind the snot block, but I, I walked out of there with a French vanilla slice because, you know, I wanted the non-abbreviated protocol. I wanted the full, <laughs> the full vanilla slice. Getting back onto MRI and, and protocoling, it's, you know, it's better to do less sequences knowing that occasionally you might have to bring a patient back for yeah. you know a repeat scan and it's pretty low when you do that rather than always just giving them the post contrast and the full scan so your recall rate should not be zero if your recall rate is zero you're over scanning that's a good way of putting it yeah there was i don't know who who said this but there was someone who was like a frequent interstate traveler by plane for business would go you know every week or every few days would travel somewhere and they said if you've never missed a flight because you're late, you're getting to the airport too early. <laughs> and I think it's a bit the same with scanning. If, if you're aiming for a zero recall, then you're over scanning lots of your patients. Uh, and how big your recall rate should be really depends on how far your patients live and how much of a hassle it is to do it. But, you know, pick a number, maybe 3%, yeah. 5%, something. 
and then keep cutting sequences until you mm. you get to kind of that number. Don't turn up late to the airport for your honeymoon flight though no. and miss that because that's what I did. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it was devastating. We managed to get another flight, but it cost us a lot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, speaking of depressing thoughts, yeah, I don't know why this came up, but now that we're talking about abdo, it, it reminded me. I was sitting somewhere thinking, I wonder how many... Oh, I know. I was rostered to emergency for some bizarre reason looking at abdominal scans. Right. So you started doing mid-journey. <laughs> Got distracted. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, you follow the the large bowel around to check that there's no cancer. Mm-hmm. And I wondered, I wonder how many of these I've looked at over my life. And then I thought, an abdominal radiologist, if they were to put all the columns they've run their eyes over <laughs> end to end... <laughs> How far would that stretch? Um, <laughs> would it go around the world? Well, that was kind of the numbers that I thought of. And then I did some quick sort of back of the envelope. Of course you did. Uh, and it's really <laughs> depressing because a gastrointestinal radiologist over their career will only see about 50 kilometers worth of large bowel. And that's like the sum total of your entire career only gets you to Ballarat. <laughs> which is one of our regional centers here next. <laughs> but what a car trip it'd be. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe we should have that for all different um, specialties, like how many um, swimming pools of CSF do you look through as a neuroradiologist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably not. It's probably, you know, not much. Depressingly little. What about this? How many T2 hyperintense white matter lesions do you see in a lifetime? If each one was a lentil. <laughs> More than the stars in, in the Milky Way, I reckon. Um, all right, we better wrap this episode up. Gaylord, how can people get in contact with us? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylord and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. You can also email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and feedback. Yeah, yeah. if you're a quantity surveyor and want to help with the mathematical calculations for length of colon tract or volume of CSF, then please do reach out to us. We'd love to get some figures on this. Yeah, that's what uh, the email address is for. <laughs> yep, include your working out. That would be great. <laughs> and uh, if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all-access pass uh, to our online courses and upcoming conference. And don't forget that doing so, not only do you get access, but you help us give it all away for free, the whole conference, all our courses, to everyone who lives in low- and middle-income countries. Less than a month to go. I know. It's already busy. busy times. Very, very busy. And w- 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 what else can people do to help out, Kayla? Uh, you can also help out by leaving us a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Awesome, awesome. I'm going to do my little sign-off here, and I want you to try and do your stay rad in your best Elmo. <laughs> I don't do Elmo voice. You don't do it? <laughs> no. Like that? Something like that? <laughs> Stay no, right, guys. No. <laughs> Maybe an E, like Bert and Ernie. Oh, yeah, do one of those. Mm. No, I can't. Hey, I can't stay so. Hey, Bert. Hey, Bernie. <laughs> Stay all right. right all Bert. right, I'll do mine and then you just think of one. Okay, here we go. And we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay right, everyone. <laughs> stay right. Bye. That's very good, mate. I get you to do some silly things. See you next week, Gaylord. <laughs> See you, Dixon. See you later. Enjoy those columns. Mm-hmm.